So in this lesson, what we have is this big scary concept that you've probably never heard of. We've got universal quantifiers. Universal quantifiers are essentially just indicator words. All right, they let you know that conditional logic is coming, kind of like how the shark music from Jaws lets you know you're about to get eaten, okay? So I'm gonna put the universal quantifiers up here on the screen now, and I want you guys to screenshot it. Have the complete list, I'm gonna show it to you again at the end of the video and show you each list you know, throughout the video as well. But for now, we're gonna go through them just one by one, but it's good to have this list just for your notes. So you might be asking yourself, what is the importance of this lesson? Why do I need to know this? Well, first up, conditional logic is showing up on about 20% of your logical reasoning section, roughly, right? Now, you can do conditional logic without universal quantifiers, but it would be much harder and much slower. Knowing the universal quantifiers makes you like 10 times faster in identifying conditional logic and then seeing how it operates, what the relationship is, right? You should definitely watch my lesson on conditional logic before this one because they're complementing each other, these two lessons and these two concepts complement each other. They build on each other. So the lesson on conditional logic is kind of like learning how to drive a car. Universal quantifiers teaches you how the car works. All right, if you wanna be a 99th percentile score, you have to have to have to understand the mechanics of language here on this test. You need to go under the hood and understand the structure of your section. Okay, how does that help you? Well, you know, LSAC's favorite thing to do is throw a wrench in your 180 plans. They like to give you some really crappy questions, some crappy structure, some crappy language to throw you off balance. Well, you know, if you're driving a car and it breaks down on the side of the road, doesn't it help if you're a mechanic, right? You can figure out what's wrong with your car and you know what you need to do to fix it, right? You know what parts you need, you know what steps to do. That's what we're gonna be doing with this lesson. We're gonna turn you into conditional logic mechanics. So whenever you get some really bad conditional logic, you know what you need to do to get back on the road. Let's get into it. First things first, we need to circle back to our conditional logic lesson, just for a little tiny review for a second, okay? Conditional logic is just, you know, the way we use language to express an abstract idea in an easy to read way. It looks like this, if A, then B, okay? What that little diagram does is it describes a relationship. Remember, the LSAT is big on relationships, they love it. What relationship does if A then B describe? It describes the relationship between the sufficient and necessary conditions. All right, so let's just recap those and then get into these helpful little quantifiers. The sufficient condition is here and our necessary condition is here. Our sufficient condition is enough to guarantee that the necessary condition will absolutely occur. The necessary condition is required in order for our sufficient condition to be true. In our conditional logic lesson, I give you a pretty easy example, right? I said, if I am in Paris, then I am in France. Essentially what I'm saying is, if you're in Paris, that's sufficient to guarantee that you're in France, okay? And you can't be in Paris without also being in France. So being in France is a requirement, is necessary to be in Paris. Last, we have the contrapositive, which is an equivalent statement of your original conditional. So if we have if A then B, our contrapositive will be not B then not A, right? Remember the contrapositive you have to negate and flip. The contrapositive of that France example would be if I am not in France, then I am not in Paris. Pretty easy, right? We cover that in the conditional logic lesson, okay? So how are my universal quantifiers going to help me? All right, they're the indicator words that let you know you have conditional logic. In my example, they are here. We have two. We have if and we have then. But this one was easy. You know, and look at all the different ways I can express the same exact idea of if I am in Paris, then I am in France. I can say you're not in Paris unless you're in France. If you're not in France, then you're not in Paris. The only people in Paris are people who are in France. Only people in France are in Paris. No one can be both in Paris and not in France. Those are all saying the same exact thing, and they're all diagrammed the same way. If in Paris, then in France. But that's confusing and hard to understand because English by itself is, is not so great a tool for representing these abstract and sometimes complicated logical relationships. 
So what we need to do is we need to install a plugin to the English language. And that's what these universal quantifiers are for. So there are four groups of logical indicators, four groups that the LSAT just loves to use and four groups that you're going to love to recognize because they make your life with conditional logic so, so much easier. All four groups include indicator words, include keywords. And what these indicator words do is they give you the structure, the roadmap of your sentence. They describe a relationship. I can have two completely different sentences. Okay. If I am in Paris, then I am in France. And then my second one, if I go to the store, then I'll buy a pizza. Both of these sentences are about completely different things. They have literally nothing in common except their indicator words. But at the structural heart of both sentences, you have the exact same relationship. And that's because you have the same indicator words. Your indicator words tell you how your sentence operates, what relationships you have present. Okay. What relationship is given to us by these particular indicator words, a conditional relationship where most of you guys get tripped up is actually in the content of the sentence. Okay. I could throw some ridiculous, crazy, abstract concept into a stimulus and, you know, just get you completely floored about it. But if I know my indicator words, I can boil it down to a statement like this. If X, then Y, and then it doesn't matter what the content is. I can describe my relationship and just plug my abstract concept back into my variables when it's time to go to my answer choices. So first up, we have group one words. Group one words have this rule. Whatever statement immediately follows a group one indicator word is the sufficient condition. Okay. These group one words are going to be if, where, when, all, the only, every and any. Okay. So let's do some examples. If I go to New York, then I get pizza. It's diagrammed this way. When I'm in New York, I get pizza. Every time I'm in New York, I get pizza. Those are all diagrammed the same way, right? You guys get the idea. They're all saying the same thing because they all have the same indicator words. Now there is one confusing indicator in group one, and it's the only. If I put my statement like this, the only people who like Pepsi are idiots. You know, I really want you guys to think about this one. What can we guarantee here? Can we guarantee in any way that someone likes Pepsi, you know, AKA do all idiots like Pepsi? No, but can we guarantee that someone is an idiot? Yes, we can. If they like Pepsi. So liking Pepsi is sufficient to guarantee that you're an idiot. Okay. Now we'll do another one. The only people who get 180s are people who studied. Can we guarantee that someone gets a 180? No, not all people who study get 180s. But can we guarantee someone studied? Yes, we can if they got a 180. Thus, getting a 180 is sufficient to guarantee that you studied. So the only, even though it sounds kind of confusing, is a direct sufficient condition indicator word. It's a group one indicator word and it should be treated as such. It's only when you have the only. Okay, now let's take a look at some practice problems. Next, we have group two. All right, we're making big moves here, guys, with conditional logic. Group two words are going to follow this rule. Whatever statement immediately follows a group two indicator word is the necessary condition. These words are going to be only, only if, only when, only where, always, and must. You can build an LSAT course only if you really know the LSAT. What's my logical indicator word? Only if. Then what idea is only if expressing? You really know the LSAT, right? So there's our necessary condition. Our other statement, therefore, must be the sufficient condition, right? So we diagram it this way. If you built an LSAT course, you really, then you really know the LSAT. This is pretty simple, right? So let's work some more practice now. Now on to group three, group three words suck, right? They're a little bit harder than group one and group two, a little bit more involved. So first let's set the stage. Okay. We can all agree by now that in a conditional statement, you have at least two ideas right? We can call them a and B or X and Y. All right. So if you have a group three word present, what you would do is you would pick either word, negate it and make it the sufficient condition. Okay. So our group three words are unless until and without. 
Okay, so that means if we have don't A unless B, what you do is you pick either word and negate it and put that in your sufficient condition slot. So if we pick A, we first negate it and we get not A, and then we put in our sufficient condition slot, right? So we have not A in our sufficient condition slot. And then all you have to do is place your other idea in your necessary condition slot. So we get left with not A, then B. Let's apply that to a practice problem. Don't go to LA unless you have a lot of money. We first, we identify our two ideas. Number one, don't go to LA. Number two, having a lot of money. First, what we're gonna do is we gotta pick our idea, which is where in this case, we're gonna pick the first one, not go to LA, and then we negate it. So don't go to LA when negated becomes go to LA. And then we put it in our sufficient condition. So we put it here, go to LA arrow. Next, we just add in our second idea into the necessary condition slot, all right? So you can see here, if you go into LA, then you have a lot of money. Likewise, if we pick our second idea from the list, number one, don't go to LA, number two, having a lot of money, if we pick that second one, right? First, same step, we negate it. Don't have a lot of money, okay? Is the negation of having a lot of money. And then what do we do? We place it in our sufficient condition slot. So don't have a lot of money is now here, and then we have our arrow. Next, what do we do? We place in our second idea. If don't have a lot of money, then don't go to LA. So let me ask you then, like why can we pick either idea and it doesn't make a difference? Okay, let's see. Let's take the contrapositive of that last example. Okay, so our original statement was if go to LA, then have a lot of money. The contrapositive of that is if don't have a lot of money, then don't go to LA. Our second statement was if you don't have a lot of money, then don't go to LA. And our contrapositive is if you go to LA, don't have a lot of money. Okay, so the contrapositive of one statement is just the original statement of the other. So for these, it doesn't matter which statement you pick, as long as you remember to negate it and place it in a sufficient condition, because the contrapositive and the original statement are equal, okay? So to recap, our group three words are unless, until, and without. Now let's work a few practice problems to drive the point home. All right, last one. So group four is very similar to group three in theory. Group four words have the rule, pick either idea, negate it, and make it the necessary condition. And our group four words are gonna be no, none, not both, never, and cannot. All right, let's use it in an example. None of my friends came to my graduation. Our logical indicator word here is none. Next, we, we list out our two ideas. Number one, being my friend. Number two, coming to my graduation. We pick one, and in this case, we'll pick the first one and we'll negate it. Okay, so the negation of being my friend is not my friend. And then we place it into our necessary condition slot right here, okay? Next, we just take our second idea and place it in the sufficient condition slot, okay? So if you came to my graduation, then you are not my friend. That makes sense, right? You know, I said it in my original conditional that not a single one of my friends showed up. So by that definition, anyone who's at my graduation can't be my friend or else my original conditional is wrong, which it can't be, okay? Again, if we pick our second statement to do this with, we just end up getting the contrapositive like we did in group three. So you can pick either idea, negate it, and put it in the necessary condition spot, put the other idea in the sufficient condition spot, and we've got our conditional diagram. So to recap here, our group four words are gonna be no, none, not both, never, and cannot. Let's do some practice for them. 